Uh, good morning. In the name of the organizing committee, I would like to welcome all of you to the number theory session of the 14th workshop of mathematics of the Windy. We have a great lineup of speakers and we are going to learn a lot of number theory in these few days. So I expect you to fasten your seat belts and be prepared for a lot of number theory. So I wish you all a wonderful three days meeting of number theory. So I call now Professor Mateus to introduce our first speaker of the day. Mateus. Thanks, Amar. Uh, good morning, everyone. And thank you for coming for our morning session uh, in number theory. And today there are uh, six talks, four in the morning and two in the afternoon. And it's a pleasure for me to announce Professor Shalom Eliahu from Université du Littoral Côté do Pal in France. And he's an expert in topics related to combinatorics, number theory, and numerical semigroups, and recently in gap sets. And today he will talk about on recent combinatorial applications of um, Macaulay's, Macaulay's theorem. So, uh, thank you for accepting the invitation, Shalom. Well, thank you very much uh, for the invitation, Mateus and, and Demar. Thank you very much for organizing this the session. Uh, yesterday, I, I enjoyed very much the presentation of the mathematics department, uh, even though I don't uh, speak uh, Portuguese, I enjoyed very much the, the presentation, the history, the presentation, and, and so on. And so it's a real pleasure to, uh, to give this, this first talk here. Uh, so I will speak about uh, co combinatorial application of Macaulay theorem, which is a classical theorem in commutative algebra. Uh, so here is an, an overview. So it's it's an old theorem, and it, if you have a, a, a graded algebra, uh, you, you want, it is finitely generated, and you want to measure the dimension on the base field of the part of the homogeneous part of degree i. And so you look at uh, the function which uh, depends on i, the dimension of the piece of degree i. And this is called the Hilbert function of, of this algebra. And you want to know how this function evolves. And what Macaulay's theorem does is a complete characterization of uh, such function. Uh, in, in the talk, I will explain the, of course, the, the terminology standard graded algebra and so on. I, I will explain the words here. So not only it's a characterization and in the characterization in particular, it gives you an upper bound on the way of this dimension grows with I. And this is a very, very interesting. So it's, a, it's a theorem in commutative algebra and algebraic geometry, but it has seen very important application to combinatorics since the 70s by Macmillan and Stanley on, on polytops, the upper bound conjecture and things like that. But here today, I want to speak about application to additive combinatorics. And uh, these applications to additive combinatorics uh, in fact, uh, emerge only uh, recently. And I will present here two such application. And uh, it seems they are the first one uh, because if you look at uh, all classical books on additive combinatorics, there is not a single mention of uh, Macaulay's theorem. So, and so I will present two such applications. So the first one was on Wilf's conjecture on numerical semigroups, which I will recall. And it dates back to 2018. And uh, the second uh, application on additive combinatorics is on the way of iterated sumsets uh, grow in cardinality. And this is a recent work with uh, Ishita Mazumdar. 
And so to start with, I will explain binomial expansions of the non-negative integers because uh, this is uh, an ingredient in, uh, in Macaulay's uh, theorem. So let, let us start with binomial expansions. So uh, fix an integer i. So this guy is fixed. And then for any non-negative integer a, you can express it in a unique way as follows. It's a sum of binomials. In the bottom, it's i, i minus one, i minus two up to one. And on the top, so this is fixed in, fixed in the bottom. And on the top, you have uh, integers, a i, i minus one, a, a one, which are strictly decreasing. A one may be zero. Well, in that case, this is zero. A one may be zero, but then a two is at least one a3 is at least two and so on. And it is not difficult to see that, again, for any such uh, non-negative integer, there's a unique such expression whenever you fix i. So it's an expression of length i. So let me give an example. You see, if you take i equals three, so you have a1, a2, A3, and these must be decreasing. So A1 can be zero, A2 can be one, A3 can be two, and that's the lowest possible. So here is the case where you have this minimal sequence and binomial two, three, binomial one, two, binomial zero, one, this is just zero plus zero plus zero. So this is zero with the smallest possible such sequence for i equals three. And then the next one, of course, is three, one, zero. In that case, so this is one, this is still zero, and this is represents one. Uh, the next case is a three, two, zero, if you want to comply with this condition. And uh, three, two, zero, so this is one plus one plus zero, and this is two. And the next one is three, two, one. And this is one plus one plus one, this is three. And now you are stuck with three to one. So the next one is four, one, zero, which is four, and then four, two, zero, and so on. So in the next slide, I, I continue with this example, but uh, in fact, so if you fix i, then this i th binomial expansion, in fact, you see it's a sort of numeration system. But, but a strange one, it has, as you will see, infinitely many digits, all, all integers, but the length is fixed, is i. So this is in contrast with standard uh, numeration system where you have uh, finitely many digits, zero to nine say, but of course the uh, length grows. And so again, let, let us continue this example with i equals three. So to, we, we, sh we shall encode, so in, the digits are A3, A2, A1. So we, we encode this expression as A3, A2, A1. And recall this is the main condition. And recall that zero is represented by, zero is represented by two, one, zero. So, so this is zero, two, three, one, two, zero, one. this is zero. And the next one is so three one zero three two zero three two one, and that's it with three. So the next one is four, which four one zero. Now you are stuck. So four two zero four two one, four three zero four three one four three two. Now I guess you understand. So this was zero one two three four five six seven eight nine, and the next is ten, is binomial five two plus zero. So five one zero five two zero five two one five three zero five three one five three two, and so on. So you see the system, and the next one is fifteen, up to six four five, and so you see the numeration system for i equals three. Of course, you can take i equals four, i equal whatever you you want. Uh, 
Okay, and uh, now that we have this strange numeration system, uh, let me describe this operation where you have an i is fixed and you have an integer a and you want to transform it into a new integer given by that. So the operation is very simple. You take a, so i is fixed. You take its unique binomial expansion with decreasing integers on the top. And then AI, by definition, what you do simply is you add one everywhere in the top and in the bottom. AK plus one, AK plus one. You add one everywhere in the top and in the bottom. And that's a new expression and it's called AI. So here's an example take i equals five. And for a, I will take the binomial of 1000. We will reuse it later in the talk. Uh, ex five by fifth binomial expansion of 1000. Uh, sorry, this, sorry, sorry. Uh, this is uh, i equals six, I'm sorry. This is i equals six. So I could have taken i equals five, but here it's i equals six, it's a, it's a little, mistake it's this is the unique binomial expansion so the digits are those in red and now what is 1006 you add one everywhere so it's 13 binomial 13 7 uh, 6 choose 9 5 choose 7 and so on and 2 choose 1 i didn't write it it's zero anyway and when you sum you get 1827. So we will re reuse this example later in the talk. So that's the operation. And this operation is an ingredient in Macaulay's theorem. Uh, it will, it will, it is a main ingredient in the characterization of Hilbert functions. So now let me explain what are standard uh, graded algebras. Uh, So a, a standard graded algebra, so it's a graded commutative algebra. Uh, R0 is a field, the base field. And to say it's grading, it means Ri times Rj is contained in Ri plus J. And uh, it, it is uh, finitely generated and uh, it is generated by R1, the uh, finite number of homogeneous generators of degree one. So that's a graded commutative algebra and standards means so finitely generated in degree one. Uh, so the grading means there is an inclusion in general for graded algebra. But since uh, the generators lie in degree one, in fact, you have equality anyway. So another way to define a standard graded algebra, a simpler way, if you wish, you take the polynomial algebra over the field K. So K is R0, the piece of degree zero, the, the scalars. Take the uh, polynomial algebra in N variables with a standard grading namely all variables have degree one and you mod out a homogeneous ideal j you kill j and and, and the quotient is is your graded algebra so it is exactly equivalent to the first definition and the hilbert function uh, of such a standard graded algebra again is simply the function which gives you the dimension of the part, homogeneous part of degree i for all i. And of course, it's a natural question to, to wonder uh, how this uh, dimension grows uh, with, with i. Think of the polynomial algebra. And uh, so in degree one, you have n. In degree two, you have all the monomials of degree two. This is, uh, 
n plus binomial n plus one over two and so on. But if you kill a, a monomial a, a binomial, it's more complicated and you want to understand this function. And Macaulay's theorem uh, tells you exactly what kind of function you can expect which arise here. And uh, let me give you uh, Macaulay's theorem. It will use the binomial expansion. So take a standard graded algebra R over the field R0 equal K. Denote DI, the dimension of the piece of degree I. Then of course, in degree zero, you have the base field. So the dimension is one. And so this is the wonderful thing. The piece, the homogeneous part of degree I plus one is bounded above by this operation on the dimension in degree I. Thus, you remember, you take the binomial expansion of that with I and you add one everywhere. So that's one half. And uh, the miracle is that the converse is true as well. Conversely, take any numerical function, I goes to di, such that d0 uh, is one, and such that di plus one is bounded above by this binomial expansion of di. Take any numerical function satisfying this right condition, then you can construct explicitly a standard graded algebra whose Hilbert function is exactly that function. This is a miracle. And uh, the construction is explicit, a bit complicated, but uh, explicit. So here's an example for the first part. Assume you have a, a, a graded algebra where the part of degree six is of dimension 1000. And you want to know, okay, what's an upper bound for the part of dimension seven? So first of all, Macaulay states that uh, D7 is bounded above by D6 expanded six. So now you remember the previous example, 1000 uh, expanded six is in fact uh, 1827 when D6 is 1000. So, so, so this tells you that the homogeneous part of R, whatever R is, is at most 1827. Well, this is a very, very important theorem and uh, it's a wonderful one. And now um, for Wilf's conjecture, which I, which I will recall later, uh, at some point I, I saw that uh, this theorem could be useful, but then you have this binomial expansion, it's a bit complicated and sort of I needed a somewhat simpler version. And uh, here is a simpler version. It's a slightly weaker, but it's easier to apply because it's a bit simpler than those binomial expansion. You take our standard graded algebra called di, the, its Hilbert function. Fix i. And now, there is a unique real number. It's not difficult to see. There is a unique real number X greater than or equal to I minus one, but a real number, not an integer, a real number such that you can express DI as the generalized binomial. It's generalized because X is no longer an integer necessarily, but it's a real number and there is a unique such real number given di and i. And then the slightly weaker function tells you that, well, then the di plus one is bounded above. So you see, you still add one everywhere, but there's only one binomial. So it's 
it's a bit weaker, but it's uh, easier to apply. And for Macaulay, uh, it did the job. So I will I will apply twice the serum in the two applications I will I will show. So you start with di, you find the, the unique real number x at least i minus one, such that di can be expressed in this way, and then di 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 plus one is bounded above by that binomial. So. Let me, I will need the notion of some set for the two applications that I want to show. And some set is the main object of study in additive combinatorics. So you take an abelian group, G plus, and you take two subsets, A and B. The sum of A and B is simply defined as follows, uh, you take the set of all possible sums uh, of an element in A and an element in B. And so this is the sum of A plus B, and it's called a uh, sum set, the sum of the sets. And additive combinatorics studies the way these things evolve, or the cardinality of such things. Now, of course, this is the sum of two sets. Uh, you can take B equals A, and, and then you call that 2A, A plus A, you call that 2A, and you can iterate, and you can take A plus A plus A plus A H times, and this is denoted H A, the H iterated sum set of A. So this is an iterated sum set. And the uh, a fundamental question, uh, if, you, if A is of finite cardinality, so how does the sequence of cardinalities of the i total sum, sum sets grow with H? And uh, the, 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 the behavior of that may widely vary with A, if A is structured, if A has no structure, if A is random, uh, this function behaves uh, very strangely. Now, I want to apply Macaulay theorem, that's new uh, to, to, to that question. And in order to do that, uh, what we will do is construct a, a standard graded algebra attached to the finite set A, such that for all H, the cardinality you are interested in, in fact, is uh, realized as the dimension of the piece of degree H in this algebra array. So what I want to do now is to, exp to show you the construction of this algebra which realizes this equality for all H. So take a field, you consider the group algebra of G over K. Formally, this is just the set of uh, linear combination of elements of G seen as formal symbols. So the, the addition, you know what it is. And the product in this algebra is just the sum in G. So let me explain that. So as, as, as a vector space, you simply take one symbol for each element of G. And the symbol, I will, I will write it TG. And now the product, again, I said the product in the algebra is in fact modeled by the sum in the group. Okay. So again, as a set, it's just a, as a vector space over K, just a set of linear combination of the TG. T is a symbol. And, and the product of, of those two generators is given by the addition in the group. And now I take this uh, group algebra and I add one variable X. Okay, and so a canonical K basis for S of course is all TG times XN, where G, well, like that. And the product of two such basis elements is the most natural you can expect, uh, 
four teats as above and uh, four x is as as you know usually with polynomials and the degree of a basis element i will declare it to be n so so tg is considered of degree zero is considered so these are the scalars in these are the scalars in s so the tg are of degree zero and uh, and uh, only uh, the exponent of x counts for the degree and therefore this is a graded k algebra and for all i uh, the piece of degree i is as as a basis uh, xi times uh, the the generators tg that's the basis as a k vector space so uh, so now uh, what is the algebra we are interested in take your finite set a in your group g uh, and ra simply is k spanned by uh, the algebra spanned over k by so this is degree zero remember ta1x so this is degree one ta1x ta2x tnx so these generators are, are all of degree one it's the k sub algebra of s spanned spanned by the set here so uh, it's a standard graded algebra it's commutative because g was commutative uh, it's ge finitely generated in degree one so it is a standard graded algebra and uh, so here is its decomposition and ri is the k vector space with basis well xi times tb and b of course is in the iterated some set a plus a plus a i time let me show you that for i equals two because r2 you you have to take two products of these guys so this is t a i x times t a j x which gives you that and now you see this is in a plus a so hence you you, you now see indeed so since the, these are a basis so the di dimension of R2 is 2a, the cardinality of a plus a, and this works for all h. And so we, we've done the job. We, we were able to model these cardinalities by the Hilbert function of this graded algebra R of a. So that's the key point. And uh, consequently, of course, then if you are interested in upper bounds on, on, on these, as is the case in additive combinatorics, then you may derive upper bounds simply because you, you, you may now apply Macaulay's theorem to the graded algebra array. So uh, next slide, so this is a key construction and, and, and the next slide is, um, application to Weaves conjecture on numerical semigroups. So uh, many people in the audience know what, what those are, but maybe some other don't know. So let me briefly recall what they are. So it, these are subsets of N. There are two equivalent definition. One, the shortest one is a cofinite submonoid of N. Uh, submonoid means it contains zero and it is stable under addition. S plus S is contained in S. And cofinite means that the complement is finite. And an equivalent definition is uh, the set of all linear combinations of some fixed integers, uh, positive integers A1, AN, which are co-prime. So an example, uh, take S equals four, seven, nine, all linear combination with non-negative coefficients of 479. And so the, these were introduced by, by Sylvester uh, in the 19th century. Uh, in fact, it was a recreation and problem and postage stamp. But later it became important in in curve theory, in, in algebraic geometry, in commutative algebra, 
so studied by Weyer Strauss, Horvitz, Rubenius, Saperi, and, and many more, many others. So as I said, it's involved in, in all these topics, more recently in coding theory. And you see the, so you see the, the definition is very, very elementary, but uh, despite uh, that, in fact, there are many open problems concerning these uh, numerical semigroups. And uh, one of them is a Wilf's conjecture, which I will describe in the next slide. Uh, no, before, let me introduce some standard terminology on uh, numerical semigroup S. So the largest gap is the Frobenius number. The largest gap plus one is the conductor that is starting from the conductor, all integers are in S. Uh, the least non-zero element is called the multiplicity and usually denoted M. In the example before, it was four, four, seven, nine. Those, uh, the minimal generators in the previous example, it was four, seven, nine. These are those elements which you cannot decompose as a sum, non-trivially as a sum. I denote them P because I also call them primitive elements or atoms. And L is the left part. This is the mysterious part in S because from C on, all integers are there. So there, there is no mystery anymore. But before the conductor, uh, so, so some integers there are in S, some are not. And this is a mysterious part, the left part. And the number of gaps is called the genus for historical reasons. And uh, so here is a Wilf's conjecture. It uses the three blue ingredients, the number of minimal generators, the number of left elements and the conductor. And uh, so, 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 so these three ingredients, so let S be an omega summary group, then the minimal number of generators also called the embedding di dimension times the number of elements below the conductor. This product is at least C. And you see it's open since uh, more than 40 years. And uh, you see the question is very elementary. It's beautiful and uh, it's still uh, open. Um, but the first result came 100 years before <laughs> uh, and it's Sylvester, who invented numerical semigroup, and he showed that, in fact, this inequality is true for two generators, as generated by A and B co-prime. And moreover, not only it's true, but in fact, it's true, it's true in a strong sense. In fact, you have uh, uh, P times L equals C when P equals two. You have equality, not, not only that. Okay, so in the next slide, uh, I will briefly recall the state of the art, not all the works, there are many works on, on this conjecture, but maybe the records. So, uh, which conjecture holds in this frontier case? So for three generators, and when I say it's a frontier case, it means if you ask the question for four generators, it is, it is open. It is incredible. Uh, so for three generators, that was done with combinatorics, but obviously inspired by construction in commutative algebra, at least according to me. And this is a wonderful paper by, by Freberg and uh, collaborators in 87, 10 years after the conjecture. So again, it's a frontier case. It's open for four generators. Uh, the conjecture is true up to uh, genus 65. These are billions and billions and billions of cases. And uh, this is a very recent work by Maria Brassard Moros and Marine Rodriguez. Uh, 
it's true when the conductor is at most three times the smallest non-zero element, the, the multiplicity. And this, well, yeah, this is what I want. This is the first application of Macaulay theorem I will show you in the next slides. And uh, I will also explain you why uh, it is important, this case. And uh, when the number of, of generators, of minimal generators is at least one third of the multiplicity. This is with graph theory. And uh, when the multiplicity up to 18, it's true. This was checked by um, Pedro uh, Garcia Sanchez and collaborator re recently. By computer in theory, of course. Uh, and uh, up to 12 left elements by brute combinatorial force. There is no computer here, but brute force. We examine lots of cases and, and it works with uh, Daniel Marine Aragon. So if you ask for C smaller than 4M, it's open. P greater than M over 4, it's open. Multiplicity 19 is open. 13 left element is open. These are really the frontier case. But still, so this is, uh, this is interesting. Because by a theorem of Xi, uh, when the genus, the number of gaps grows to infinity, then almost all numerical semigroup uh, satisfy uh, this condition. The proportion of those numerical semigroups satisfying that tends to one. And so therefore, uh, sometimes it's called, this case is called generic because when G is very large, almost all satisfy that the conductor is at most three times the multiplicity. And, uh, and therefore, uh, uh, so, so again, I said, so Wilf conjecture holds in, in the generic case, and therefore it holds asymptotically as the genus goes to infinity by the result of Xi. And let me briefly give a sketch of proof. Just for technical simplicity, we assume that C is a multiple of M. And hence, so here the quotient is at most three by, hypothe by this hypothesis. So now you take the famous Aperi set with respect to the multiplicity, all those elements of S from which you cannot subtract M while staying in S. This is the upper set. And uh, you consider uh, slices of the upper set given by those intervals of length M, call that AI. Uh, the hypothesis here tells you that uh, only uh, A1, A2, A3 are of interest. After that, they are empty. And now we want to, to know how many aperies of level one, sums of aperies of level one remain aperies. And this cardinality I will write like generalized binomial X2. Then I apply condensed Macaulay. And with condensed Macaulay, I can, uh, one can show that if you are interested in three A1, so A1 plus A1 plus A1, which are still a peri of level three, then this is bounded above by x plus one over, over three. So in fact, the story goes in reverse. In fact, when I was before, before Macaulay, when I was looking to solve Wilf's conjecture in this case, sort of, I saw that I needed to get an upper bound on the set with respect to this cardinality. And then, uh, the C, and then I understood that there was a graded algebra and then Macaulay came in and then I needed the condensed Macaulay to, to, to get the simple statement. But then when you know that, uh, 
there are lots of technical details, of course, but it suffices to know that. And when you know that, you can prove the Wilfs inequality. Voilà. Modulo 20 or 25 more pages, that's the sketch of the proof. But Condense Macaulay was crucial there. OK, so that's one application. And the, and the second application is the growth of hydrated some sets. So again, this is uh, more recent with Ishita Mazumdar. And so you take an abelian group, or for that matter, a semi-group is, is, is also OK. You take a finite subset. You take the HA is the H hydrated some set of A. And again, the problem is how do these cardinality grow? And more specifically, if you know this cardinality for H, what can you say for H plus one or H minus one? So this was studied uh, several decades ago, and there's a theorem by Pruneke in 1970, uh, which says that if you know HA in cardinality, then IA is bounded, uh, uh, bounded below by h a to the power i over h. And this is a very important inequality in additive combinatorics. Uh, and uh, in fact, with uh, uh, Ishita, we have uh, uh, improved uh, this inequality uh, with Macaulay in a rather, uh, uh, in a rather substantial way, you will see. So, this is for all i, but in fact, it suffices to show that uh, it's true for i equals h minus one when h is given anyway. And we will improve that. Uh, and so the original proof of Kluneke was with graph theory. Then many new simpler proof came later and generalized versions, but I will stick with this classical version. And we have a strengthening factor uh, denoted uh, uh, h over x binomial, generalized binomial xh to the power one over h. This is called theta xh. And what we've, what we've shown with uh, Ishita is that in this inequality, you can put in this fa new factor theta xh. Exactly that with this extra factor theta xh where x is such that uh, HA can be expressed in as this generalized binomial. And now, of course, it's only interesting if you can prove that this number is, is, is strictly more than one, which it is, and it's less than 2.71 to 2e, in fact. But still, and in fact, often this number quickly this number reaches two. So in general, you can expect um, yeah, a factor two. Let me show you a curve for this function. Or let me give a proof, but I will go quickly. In fact, uh, condensed Macaulay give you exactly that, if you remember, because HA was XH. So minus one, in fact, it gives you one, X minus one, H minus one. And, and of course, you can express this binomial in terms of this preceding binomial, this is standard. And hence, the, you, take, you take this inequality and you end up with this factor. Sorry, I went quickly, but this is technical and easy. And the important, important thing is to get this factor here. And you, you take H roots and, and then you get your inequality. And now again, what I want to show you is that in fact, this is uh, more than one and it's bounded above by the basis of natural, natural logarithm. So here's a curve for theta xh. You take uh, x equals 1000 and h goes one, two, three up to 1000. And, and this is the height of theta xh. So you see when, uh, H is about, uh, I don't know what, uh, about, uh, I don't remember, about 50 or something. You almost reach E, 2.71, almost. And you see that this number, you see you are above two for half of, almost half of the time. 
essentially from H going from three to 500, essentially. So, so just show you that this strengthening factor is, is sub substantial. Okay, uh, and uh, let me give you an example, a concrete example, take a, a set of integers, such that uh, it's six cited at some set counts 1000 elements, let's say, and, and such things exist. Uh, if you remember Plunike, or if you don't remember Plunike anyway, it tells you 5a is at, is at least 317 under this hypothesis, and 7a is at most 3000, and so on. And now we apply uh, our theorem, and uh, you see the, the lower bound on 5a uh, jumps from 317 to 511, and the, the upper bound on 7a uh, drops from 3000 to 1800. Um, so this is really substantial. And the proof is simply, you, you, you remember, we can measure these things by the Hilbert function of a suitable uh, graded algebra. I gave the construction. And so here in this case, so the dimension of R6 is by hypothesis 1000. Now we apply a Macaulay and Macaulay uh, tells you, well, 7a is dimension of R7 is bounded above by this binomial expansion. And if you recall, it was 1827. So this is, uh, this is uh, how we get it. What about the lower bound? Um, well, assume for contradiction that this is not true. So the dimension of R5 is at most 510, 510. So then uh, we, we take the five, fifth binomial expansion. We apply the uh, operation by adding one everywhere. And it gives you 999, which is not enough <laughs> because then Macaulay would imply that the piece of dimension six is, bo is bounded above, uh, the, the, the dimension of the piece of degree six is bounded above by 999, which is not the case because the hypothesis was it was 1000. So here's an extended comparison still with sets of integers satisfying this hypothesis. So, uh, you, you see the, an, an, an upper bound for Nane, Plunike gives 30,000, uh, Macaulay gives 5,000. Uh, and a lower bound for 5A, Plunike gives, oh, uh, this, this we know, but you see, for example, Plunike tells you A must have at least four elements. Well, no, in fact, A must have at least eight elements and so on. So th this is really much, much, much better than, than Plunike. And not only it's much better, but in fact, it's nearly optimal. Let me explain that. Again, in this hypothesis, we have these bounds and we claim these are close to optimal. Uh, indeed, here's a very concrete example, uh, a set with eight elements. Yeah, eight elements. Uh, in fact, if you compute the six iterated sum set, it's, it has exactly 1000 elements. And uh, these are uh, the thing. So you see 5a is 528 and the lower bound was 511. You see, so it's, it's pretty good. And 7a it's 1683, whereas the upper bound was 1800, which is pretty close. So in fact, here's a question uh, still under the hypothesis. Maybe these are the best possible. We looked a lot by computer and this is the best we could fi find. So is, is this optimal? So in the last minute, let me encode this as an extremal problem. You take an abelian group, you take M H I positive integer with M at least at most the cardinality of G. And again, yeah, you, you, you look at the best possible lower bound for IA when i is smaller than h, and the best possible upper bound for ia when i is greater than h, and a runs over all subsets. You, you, you see this is a combinatorial problem, all subsets of g, such that in cardinality, h a is m. And for instance, for i equals h plus one, 
So this is exactly what Plunek gives you. And our result, this is exactly what Macaulay gives us. And it turns out that this is uh, much better than this one. And uh, here, example revisited. So this is uh, exactly the data we had. And Puneke gives that. Our result with Macaulay gives us that. And uh, this concrete example I showed two slides ago, two slides ago, gives in fact uh, that. So you see uh, again, the supper bound we got with Macaulay is uh, obviously is uh, not far from the optimal. And in fact, this gives you a narrow sort of narrow window for this exact number that we don't know. But we conjecture that, uh, yeah, this is, this is a true value. It will be very hard to, to check because you need to, to look at all subsets. So here's a probably very hard problem, determine this function even over Z, just over Z, determine this function for all M and H. Uh, and uh, that's about it. Uh, thank you for your attention. Obrigado por sua atención. Thank you very much. Let's thank the speaker. So thanks a lot, Shalom, for your nice talk. And uh, does anyone have uh, a question or a comment for Professor Eliahu? Uh, I, I have a question, uh, Shalom. In yes. fact, there are three questions. I don't know if there's if we will have time, but when you when you talk about uh, some sets and and this kind of things, I I remember Hervit's question and the bourgeois condition. So, do you think if there is any connection between those results with uh, bourgeois condition? Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. In fact, we, we have a we have a, a work with uh, with colleagues in in Cadiz uh, where we tackle this question of bourvites, and uh, we we do use some additive combinatorics. Mm -hmm. But let me remember uh, the paper was submitted several months ago. It's not yet uh, accepted, but uh, we we did use uh, additive combinatorics to to tackle the question, but we use the classical theorem of uh, Nathanson on the growth of iterated some sets. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't remember now, I don't think we used uh, this approach here. No, we didn't. But we did use uh, a lot of uh, additive, classical additive combinatorics, yes. Uh, really nice. Thank you for your answer. Uh, the, the next question was, was about the following. Uh, when, you, when you take a, a numerical semigroup, you can ask several questions, uh, Wilf's conjecture, Braza Moros conjecture, and some other, some other problems. Uh, in your slide, when you talk about upper reset set of a numerical semigroup, naturally you can define the upper set of a, a gap set, for instance. And maybe we can try to extend this, this notion for, for the so-called M extensions. So mm -hmm. do, do you think uh, if, there is, uh, if there is any sense to, to make this, those questions for the set of M extensions instead of numerical semigroups groups or, or gap sets, or uh, maybe it's, it's not a, a good approach? Uh, no, I think it would be a good idea, in fact. I think it would be a good idea, but... No, I think it's worth, it's worth it to look at it. Yes. Mm -hmm. If you have any ideas, then just go ahead. Yeah. Uh, sorry, Mateus, I, uh, about the previous question, uh, I was mentioning a, a, a preprint, uh, which is not yet accepted, but this preprint is available on archive. Mm -hmm. 
So I will look for it. Yeah. And for the, your second question, yes, I think it's worth it to, to have a look at it in this more general, uh, more general than for N extensions, yes. Okay, so thanks. Uh, is there any questions? No? So well, let's... I, I can make a comment that I'm very impressed with this. The improvement, the Macaulay. You're calling Macaulay, but you should call Yelahu, no? Yelahu <laughs> improvements. <laughs> this is a quite impressive, quite impressive. Oh, thank well, you. And, you. and you present in a way that gets us all excited to study the thing. So <laughs> I congratulate thank you, so much you on for this. The compliment. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you okay. so much. Thank you, Emma. So let's thank Professor Eliahu again.